The Adventures of Philo Vance, starring Jose Ferrer. In the good old summertime, in the good old summertime, she's your tootsie wootsie in the good old summertime. Happy Lane. On a night like this, Vance, no Washington assignment for me, no ridiculous detecting for you. Oh, I love it. In all the realm of crime and crime detection, in all the history of murder, mystery, intrigue, the master of them all, Philo Vance. Tonight, the case of strange music. Tonight, the case of strange music. At the moment, Philo Vance and his friend, Lane Randall, are driving back to town after a dinner in the country, and Vance says, Not a care in the world. What, Vance? Mm, nothing. I just said it's a beautiful night. I've had a good dinner. Curry will have a cold bottle waiting. I haven't a care in the world. Darling, how stuffy. A cold bottle indeed. Where did you pick up that expression? Oh, in the book, if you must know. Certain types of men invariably take their fair ladies back to their apartments for cold bottles and birds. Something like that. Just what types of men, may I ask? Amorous ones. Oh. Well, what's the matter? Don't you think I care, Lane? Really care? About your stomach, the way you sound. Oh, Vance, look! Where? There, it's a carnival. Oh, and a Ferris wheel. Oh, Vance. I haven't been to a carnival in ages. And a merry-go-round. Oh, Vance, let's stop, please. <laughs> Idiot. You'd love it, too. You know you would. Well, come on, then. Only remember, I was all for that cold bird. Peanuts. <laughs> oh, don't they smell wonderful? Yes, I know. Boy, large bag, please, for my... Uh, my little girl. <laughs> Lane, dear, the car's back this way. Vance, a wax museum. Here we go again. What wax museum? Right there, see? The bloodiest crimes in history recreated before your very eyes, 25 cents. Oh, golly. Golly. This we've got to see. Oh, mister. I wonder if Van Johnson has this trouble. Two tickets, please. Me and my gentleman friend, we want to see the bloody crime. What your gentleman friend wants, Lane, is something... Oh, don't be unromantic, darling. Come on. Remember that one, Lane? The Snyder Gray murder case? Don't they look real? Oh, here's Dillinger over here. See, he was coming out of a theater in Chicago when they got him. Oh, and look in this case. Vance, it's a... Oh! Lane. That, that man, he... He's real. <laughs> You're a complete idiot. Look, Lane, it's wax, just like all the rest. Oh. Well, it gave me a shock. Funny... For a moment, I could have sworn... You've had too much pink lemonade, lady. Let's go, shall we? Where's the car? Over to the right, I... Oh, excuse me, please. Oh, will you help me, please? Yes. That girl. My ankle. I've turned my ankle. Oh, she's going to faint. Here, miss, here. Thank you. I... Take it easy. Just lean on me a moment. Lane. Are you all right? Yes, thank you. I didn't mean to faint. I turned my ankle. It's quite all right. Perhaps we can find a bench of some sort. I... Francis? Francis, come here. I can't, Bertram. My ankle. I've turned my ankle. Nonsense. Come along, I say. Then we were getting back. I can't. I tell you, I can't walk. Francis? I'm afraid the lady is right, sir. She did turn her ankle. Then I'll take care of her, thank you. Give me your arm, Francis. No! I'm certainly not going to carry you all the way back to the house. Never mind, Bertram. I'll get there alone. You little fool. Must you make a scene every time we go out of the house? Give me your arm. That will do, sir. If you won't carry me, Bertram, I'm sure this gentleman will. What? Do you mind, dear? Francis, I warn you. Would you mind, Mr... Uh, Vance. Philo Vance. Mr. Vance, we live just through the field beyond here. Why? Newberry is my name. Mrs. Bertram Newberry. And this is my husband. How do you do? Francis, I demand that you stop this display and come home. Get away from this man. Yeah. Will you, sir? Uh, Mr. Vance, really, I, I can't make it alone. I'd be delighted. You don't mind, Lane? Oh, no, Vance. If you like, I'll walk in front of you with trumpets. And you, Mr. Newbury? Go on, go on. I warn you, Francis, someday you'll go too far. Oh, 
There we are. Now, we'll just put you down in this porch chair, Mr. Newbury. You're there. so kind, Mr. Vance. Oh, think nothing of it. Lame. I'm sorry if your husband was disturbed, Mrs. Newbury. If you like, I'll try to explain that you did turn your ankle. Oh, don't bother, please. He's gone in the house now. He'll just sulk for a few hours. Let him. I see. Could I offer you a drink? You've been so kind. We should go, Vance. It must be quite late. It's exactly five minutes to ten. Oh, Ed, dear, I didn't know you were on the porch. I won't be for long, Aunt Frances. I'm waiting for a program on the radio. Oh, excuse me. This is my nephew, Mr. Newberry, Mr. Vance. Newberry, yeah. Oh, my dear, I'm so sorry. I didn't quite get your name. Mud. I beg your pardon? Uh, Miss Randall. Uh, Miss Randall? How nice. Friends, thank you. On the porch, Tom. I saw Bert going to the library. Oh, I beg your pardon. Tom, dear, these very nice people carried me home from that horrible carnival. Courage? Oh, what do you... Uh, Mrs. Newbury has a turned ankle. Oh, I see. He made you go, did he, Fran? It was easier to humor him. He insisted that we walk down there. His little joke. I see. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Randall. Mr. Randall. Mr. Vance, Mr. Ronlander. How do you do? Mr. Ronlander lives on the next estate, our neighbor. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, I didn't see you, Ed. Is that so unusual? Ed, dear, please. I have my car in the drive. Can I drop you people? Oh, thank you, no. We're parked just through the field. Ready, Lane? I am, Vance. You must forgive my husband's behavior, Mr. Vance. He has a rather strange sense of humor. Oh. His money went to his head. Ed, you mustn't. It's true, isn't it? He enjoys his little joke, Mr. Vance, like tonight. It amused him to make me dress up just to go to a country carnival. He insisted that I wear an orchid. It's a very beautiful orchid. My husband and I don't go out socially, you see. Tonight was his way of showing me a good time. He got quite a kick out of it. A friend, no. I didn't mind, Tom. Anything to... Oh, but really, this is most discourteous. I... I shouldn't be talking this way at all. Why not? Is there anybody who doesn't know... Why not put it in the papers, Aunt Fran, and add, Bertram Newberry spends a dime. Edward, that will do. Nicely, I think. Well, I'm going to my room. It's ten o'clock. At least Uncle Bertram won't have to pay for the radio. It's free. Really, I'm so embarrassed. If you'll let me ring for a drink, I... I'll get them, Fran. Uh, no, really, we are going. Take the path down by the river, Mr. Vance. What? It's a little longer, but it's pleasanter walking. Why, I... Good evening, Bert. I suggest you go now, Mr. Vance. Get out. All of you. Get out of my house. Vance. Right. Lane, uh, this is our exit line. Good night. It was nice to meet you. Well. Chummy, aren't they? Oh, come on. He was right about the path by the river. Mm, look at the moon. Of all the neurotic, mixed up, unbelievable. Oh, come now, Lane. Don't be so shocked. You've seen family skeletons before. Never such naked ones. Why, they don't care what they say or who knows it. Mm, money, darling. It makes you that way sometimes. Oh. What's the matter? Blue something? One of my gloves. My good white ones, too. What, do you want me to go back? Not on your life. Besides, I'm almost sure I dropped it in that wax museum. I remember putting them in my purse in there. Well, we'll stop and inquire. Thanks. Yes? Am I crazy, or do I hear music? What? Wait. Listen to me. Newbury House. An organ, isn't it? Oh, gives me the shivers. Just listen to it. Strange. Strange music. Mournful. <laughs> we will be too in a minute. Uh, still want to see about your glove? Uh, if you don't mind, Vance. They're so darn hard to get these days. Isn't it odd what meeting people like that will do? We had so much fun at this carnival an hour ago. Now it seems almost sordid. I'll ask about the glove. What was it? Why, kid. Okay, kid. I suppose it is silly to worry about people like that. I suppose... Oh, I don't suppose anything. Have they found it? No, but for 50 cents we can go into the museum and look for ourselves. But didn't you tell him that we were... I didn't argue, Lane. It's easier to buy the tickets and look. Come on. Well, it won't be there now, I'm sure. want to look at the exhibit. Not now. No, Snyder and Gray haven't changed me. I'm his Dillinger. Look for my glove, silly. We've seen the exhibit. It's amazing how they can take wax and... Lane. Did you find it? Lane, in that exhibit. That body is real. Oh, no, you don't. I bit once, darling, but not Lane, again. I'm serious. Look. Good Lord. Vance. It's 
right lane. That's Bertram Newbury's body. Bertram Newbury, his body part of an exhibit in a wax museum. We'll return in just a moment with more of the case of strange music. And now, back to the adventures of Philo Vance. You came out fast enough, John. You remember Lane, of course. Lane, the district attorney. Of course I do. How are you, John? Well, not too happy, Lane. I just bit a small slam when Vance's call came in. Well, where are they, Vance? Inside? Well, I suggested they stay in the library. As soon as I found a patrolman to remain with the body down at the carnival, Lane and I came back here to the house. Yeah. Who was here? All of them. Francis, the wife, Ed Newbury, he's a nephew, and Tom Rhinelander. Who is, to put it delicately, interested in Mrs. Newbury. I see. Any ideas, Vance? Oh, I'm full of them, John. Care to hear? I would. Well, down in the wax museum, we have a body. The body is stabbed in the back and placed in an exhibit. Fifteen minutes before it was placed in that case, that body told us to get the blazers off this porch. Which we did. Uh, go on. Inside, three people. A wife who was quite obviously put up with a lot from the old boy. And who loves her neighbor. <laughs> Tricky, darling. Thank you. Number two, a disgruntled nephew who apparently had nothing to do in life but wait for the reading of his uncle's will. Money. Bertram's money seems to be Edward's big interest. And finally, the boy next door. Uh, he's got money, incidentally. I know the name. Well, he's rather pleasant, John. We had a little talk while you were on your way. Oh, then you questioned him. And two at the house. Vance has been playing detective like mad, John. Oh, thanks for the playing, Lane. Well, Vance, who, what, why? Well, frankly, John, I'm not sure. Not sure at all. What about the servant? Oh, all accounted for. Uh, let's go in, shall we? Lane and Mrs. Newbury were hitting it off so well earlier this evening... Maybe there's a chance for a beautiful friendship. All right, son, what's your story? I could write a book. Well, you might have to. You admit the knife in your uncle's back belonged to you? Look, I went all through this with him. Sure, it's my knife. I use it fishing. And you left it where, Ed? In my room, I told you. It was in my fishing box. I saw it there this morning. May I cut in? Sure, go right ahead. When you left us on the porch this evening, Ed, you announced that it was 10 o'clock. Remember, Van? Vividly. And we found your uncle's body down at the Wax Museum at 10.20, so it's simple. Account for those 20 minutes and you haven't anything to worry about. Can you account for them, son? I, uh... I was listening to the radio. Alone? In my room. I was alone. <laughs> That's not a very good accounting, boy. Look here, That I'm... will do. Send in Mr. Rhinelander, please. And don't leave this house. I'll warn you again. Yeah. Tough, isn't he? His knife, his money when Newbury dies. That's a familiar story, then. But the fingerprints on the knife were not a man's. The sergeant was sure of that. Easy enough. Ed got Francis to handle the knife, then preserved her prints by using a handkerchief. A very old trick. Then they are her prints, John? He checked. They're hers, all right. They match with everything in her room. In my room? Oh, come in, Gabby. Come in. I didn't hear you. Thank you. It's after midnight. I was just wondering, is it entirely out of order if I have some food prepared? Now, see here, Mrs. Newbury. Oh, uh, John. Yes, that. Uh, an excellent idea, food. By all means, see to it, Mrs. Newbury. I'm starved. Why, Vance? And ask Mr. Rhinelander to come in, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Vance. I'll have sandwiches and coffee brought in. Ed said you wanted to... Oh, friend, dear. It's all right, Tom. It's all right. Come in, Mr. Rhinelander. Come right in. Thank you. Now, this is going to be abrupt, I'm afraid, but quite to the point. You are in love with Mrs. Newbury. Very much, Mr. Markham. Are you shocked? Why, no. I'm the cad who loves another man's wife, I suppose. But Bert... Bert wasn't a man. Not to Francis. He... Uh, go right on talking, Mr. Rhinelander. I just want to... Oh! Silly way to make sandwiches, Mrs. Newbury. Crouched against the door. Come in. There isn't anything to say, is there? I was listening. If you ask me, I think there's a lot to say. Do you, Lane? What? You can ask questions all you want to, Vance. You know who did it, and so do I. You're forgetting motive, you know. Edward had that. Right, Vance? Oh, money's a good one, John. Always was. Motive my foot. This woman hated her husband. Yes, and she loves him. It's obvious. You've told them, Tom. Why not? If that isn't motive, what is? And as for the crime, her own fingerprints are on the knife in her husband's back. Well, there is something to that, Mrs. Newbury. I told you, my husband brought me the knife this afternoon. I was cutting flowers with it. That's just plain silly. There are dozens of garden shears in the tool house. Vance and I saw them. 
Why go way up to Edward's room into his fishing box and use that particular knife? I don't know, I tell you. Well, the boy could have brought it to her, you know. Oh, Heath, send him in, will you? Might as well have the whole group. Well, you made a nice try, Lane, but you slipped up on one detail. Frances couldn't have gotten the body into that exhibit case, not with her twisted ankle. Ankle? See this book on the table? Mm Mm-hmm. Frances, catch! (gasps) See? A very neat catch, Mrs. Newberry. And you were pretty quick on your twisted foot, too. Lane, you've done it. Vance, she's remarkable. Well, Vance... Uh, Where were you between 10 and 10.20, Francis? Oh, Vance. I was playing the organ. You said yourself, Mr. Vance, you heard me when you were walking back to your car. Did you, Vance? Yes, we we did. And you, Mr. Rhinelander, where were you? I was with Francis. I I was here in this room listening to her play. I see. Oh, John. Yes, Vance. I'm supposed to come in By all means, Ed, uh, you're just in time for a concert. You remember what you played earlier this evening, Mrs. Newbury? Yes, I do. It's horrible music. Bertram wrote it years ago, and he made me play it over and over again. Some nights for hours. Uh, Play it now, will you please? No? Why? Please, Mrs. Newbery. I'd be glad to. It has no name. It's... It just sounds like this. Quite sure this is the music you played tonight? I told you. Yes, well, that will do, thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I should like to offer a musical selection. Vance, you? Well, it's quite easy on this organ lane. You see, it's equipped for automatic player roles. Uh, here's one I picked up about the house this morning. What have you got? Uh, listen, Mrs. Newbury. There we are. Just snap this little switch and listen for yourself. Boy, that's. Can't be. Vance, it's the same music. Oh, sure, Lane. Of course, but I... Turn it off. Please, turn it off. Bertram wrote that music. He made me play it over and over. I hate it. I hate it! And you still say you played that piece? After that, Mrs. Newbury? I did, I swear I did. Bert insisted. I played it over and over to humor him. Better do better than that, Francis. I found the roll in your desk drawer upstairs. No, you're lying. But you... Now we're getting somewhere. Turned ankle. Uh, Vance, will you, uh, will you... Uh, gladly, John. As the detective would say, I'll unravel the whole thing. Edward? Me? Now, listen I here. I told you, motive every time. Uh, go on, Vance. Quickly, Edward. You said you listened to a radio program, something called... Uh, what did you say again? The Tenor-Voiced Killer. Uh, he's on every week. <laughs> Strenuous, to say the least. Who done it, Edward? What? Well, isn't that the phrase? In tonight's program, who done it? Why, the butler. Stebbins, his name was. He... He, he poisoned the guy with a secret formula made out of ink. Uh, good boy. And that takes care of you, Edward. Sit down. Just how does it take care of him, Vance? I called the studio, John. The butler did it all right. Edward was listening to that program. All 15 minutes of it. All right, so it's not Edward. Let's get back to these two. Right, Lane. You weren't playing that organ, you know, Francis. Matter of fact, you were in your room, packing. Mr. Vance. Just as you, Tom, were at your house doing the same thing. Your grips, incidentally, are still in the trunk of your car outside. I looked. I... Packing? For what? Oh, Reno, I should think. Wasn't that why you turned your ankle, Francis? You and Tom had planned to leave tonight for some time. Bert's little joke of attending the carnival almost ruined your plan. It's not true, I tell you. It's no use, Tom. He'll only find out. We might as well tell him the truth now. At last. You were planning to leave your husband tonight. Yes, I was. I, I did make that roll for the organ myself. I was going to put it on while Bert was listening upstairs and then leave with Tom. You made a roll for an organ, a complicated thing like that. It's not hard, John. If you know the keyboard, you can work out just which holes in the paper will make each note play. It takes patience, but it can be done. I had a great deal of patience. And courage, I'd say. Right, Vance? Go on, Lane. It's obvious. Bertram found out about their plan, and they killed him. That's good enough for me. But not for me, John. Frances didn't kill her husband. No, and neither did Rhinelander. You thought she did, though, didn't you, Tom? Otherwise, you wouldn't have lied to save her. You wouldn't have pretended you'd heard her play the organ at the time of Bert's death. Now, see here, Vance. If Edward didn't do it, now you say these two didn't do it. Yes, Vance, in case you've forgotten, the man is dead. Who killed him? My moment, eh, Lane? Well, suppose we all walk down to that wax museum, shall we? And I promise when we get there, I'll tell you who did the job. <laughs> All right, Vance, it's all your show. Go ahead. Well, thank you, John. Now then, here's the original exhibit, as Lane and I saw it first this evening. 
Lippy the Knifer, that's that figure in wax against the wall there, was standing just where he is now. His victim, also a wax dummy, was on the floor, just as you see Bertram's body now. I can't look. I'm afraid you must, Mrs. Newbury. Really, Vance, we know all this. Someone simply took the wax victim out of the exhibit and put Bertram's body in its place. Right, Lane. Look at Bertram's body, John. Face down, knife in the back. I see that. Now, look at Lippy here against the wall. A body made of wax, but strong as steel. These dummies are steel, you know, with a wax coating. Oh, Lane. Yes? Uh, pull on Lippy's arm, will you? Pull hard. It's firm, all right. And the dummy's tied to the wall. Uh, tied with your fish line, incidentally, Edward. What? Oh, this was carefully planned, Edward. By Very whom? carefully planned. By whom, then? In a moment, John. Now, we'll take the knife from Bertram's body like this. Oh. It's all right, dearest. And place the knife in the dummy's hand so. Notice, John. The handle pushes firmly against the hand with the blade pointing out. I, I see that. Now we roll up the dummy sleeve, pull down this rather intricate trigger spring. What the... Vance, what on earth is that? The spring lane. See? We set the knife against it, draw this fine piece of thread out here, like this. Follow me, John. But... Now... Oh, Edward. Yes? Uh, will you help me a moment, please? Sure. I want to lift Bertrand's body into a standing position. That's it. Slowly, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Vance, is this necessary? I mean it. Uh, it's quite necessary, Tom. Observe, John. Bertram is now standing directly in front of the dummy, and the point of the knife is directly at his back, in the exact spot where it entered his body. Uh, go on, then. Now we take the thread attached to the spring, place it in Bertram's hand, give it a slight pull, so... Oh! And Bertram is stabbed in the back. You can put the body down now, Edward. Yes, sir. But, Vance, that spring, the thread, all that... Who did it? Who in the world would... Well, Vance? No one, John. Bertram Newbury killed himself. What? What? He had time, Lane. We took the long way back here from the house, remember. And while we did, Bertram came down here alone, got into this exhibit, and committed suicide. The end of a plan he'd worked on a long, long time. But I... I, I... Bertram was ill. Ill in mind and body, I'd say. When he discovered or guessed that Francis was leaving him, he planned it that way. Got a fingerprints on the knife and then used this spring mechanism and the dummy to plunge the knife into his own body. That way, Francis, he hoped you'd die for the crime. Good Lord. And I was to be the accomplice. Exactly, Tom. But reason that the police would be sure Francis couldn't have carried him down here, especially with a turned ankle, you were to be accused of doing that for her. Vance. Well, Lane? What were the customers in this place doing while Bert was playing Poke the Circle with the dummies? Now, see that curtain? It's used when they're changing the exhibits. Oh. Uh, pull it down if you like, Lane. With that cold bird in a bottle, it might not be bad at all. The script for tonight's program was adapted for radio by Bob Shaw from the characterization originally created by S.S. Van Dyne. Philo Vance is played by the brilliant young star of Broadway, Jose Ferrer. Lane Randall is played by Francis Robinson. And this is Don Hancock. This is the National Broadcasting Company.